Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Placed on administrative leave and now arrested, a Bear County deputy, 23-year-old Andrew Garcia, booked into the Bear County Jail for allegedly using a taser on cadets in training. Yeah, that announcement of the arrest coming this afternoon, a couple of weeks after Garcia was placed on administrative leave. Camelia Juarez live at the Bear County Jail. Camelia, how many cadets came forward to make a complaint? Steve, Myra, two cadets came forward against Andrew Garcia. Garcia is behind bars here at the Bear County Jail. Sheriff Javier Salazar says that Garcia used his taser on one cadet and then threatened to use it on another. The first incident happened in November when the a cadet reported Garcia used the taser on them at a close range. In December, another cadet accused Garcia of threatening to use his taser, some instances pointing the taser at the cadet. When the stun gun trigger is pulled, it leaves an electronic receipt. Sheriff Salazar says investigators cross-referenced trigger pulls to the cadet's work schedules. The taser was used in drive stun mode on that cadet. Uh, causing discomfort and certainly causing a concern that the uh, activities would continue. Uh, my understanding is that this cadet throughout times during the shift felt in danger, felt threatened. Retention is the, is the number one uh, cause for concern with us. And this sort of thing doesn't make it any easier for us to recruit or retain. Sheriff Salazar says that his office takes hazing and potential hazing seriously as an effort to retain deputies. For now, Garcia is facing four charges, which include assault with bodily injury, harassment, and official, official oppression. Garcia has been given a letter with intent to terminate him. Reporting live from the Bear County Jail, Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Camelia, thank you. New at six, two teenagers facing charges in connection with a shooting last night in New Braunfels. 19-year-old Antonio Baltazar III and a 15-year-old boy are facing charges, including aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and possession of a controlled substance. According to police, officers responded to the 200 block of Rhine Road for a shots fired call. Police say a man in a black hoodie fired several shots at people as they got out of their Jeep. They were not hit, but one victim was injured by some broken glass. Officers tracked the suspect car down and pulled it over along I-35 and arrested the two teenagers. Police say they found drugs and two handguns in that car. A man charged with aggravated robbery after police say he robbed and assaulted a 71-year-old man. Booking records show 31-year-old Valdemar Dylan Valdez was arrested after the victim was able to help identify him. Officers say back on December 4th, the victim drove Valdez to a Jack in the Box restaurant in the medical center, then to an apartment complex on Broadview. According to arrest records, once they were there, Valdez demanded the victim's wallet and bag and repeatedly punched him. Again, the victim was 71 years old. He was hurt badly enough he had to go to the hospital. Records show Valdez is facing several more charges unrelated to the assault case. San Antonio homicide investigators looking for some help to track down those responsible for the death of this man, Raymond Sneed. Sneed was found shot to death inside his apartment at Alamo State's apartments in July of last year after police responded to a call for a shooting. During their investigation, witnesses told police that they saw a woman leaving that location. Investigators are looking for information on her or the car that she was in. Anyone with details is asked to call the number that you see here. Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. New details emerged today in a pretrial hearing for an Air Force major accused in the 2019 murder of his wife. Andre McDonald is facing up to life in prison if found guilty. In February of 2019, Andreen McDonald disappeared. It would be four months before her remains were found on a private property in North Bear County. Today, before the trial officially begins, testimony was heard from several witnesses, which included Andrean McDonald's mother and her friend, who was the one to call police to let them know Andrean was missing. Carol Gonbar told the court she took photos of a burn pile outside of Andrean's home and blood she found inside that house when she went looking for her friend. We noticed on the light switch there was some blood and hair. When you saw that, what were you thinking? I was thinking Adrian's dead. Yeah. 
Her testimony all part of evidence that the defense wants thrown out. The defense is also questioning search warrants carried out at the McDonald's home, as well as some cell phone data. The judge will ultimately make a decision on what testimony to allow. That trial expected to officially start on Monday. That's when the jury will actually be in the room. You can watch live on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, and KSAT YouTube page. Who will sit on the San Antonio City Council come June? 14 candidates completed their applications for a spot on the May 6th ballot today. It's the first day of filing. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger talked with some of the hopefuls, new and familiar, who want your vote. I'm filing. They started arriving at City Hall a little after 8. New and familiar candidates filled out paperwork and swore oaths around the same table they hope to eventually sit at as elected officials. Swear that I will support. And the incumbents looking for another term. The more tenure you get on council, the more you're able to get things done in a way, you know. So in order to keep doing that work, I need more than two years. The challengers looking for a chance to make a change. Mainly the crime in the city, how it's increasing. My campaign is basically uh, back to basics. Rather than be a part of the problem, I'd like to be a part of this solution. Some see opportunity in the newly wide open race for district seven following Councilwoman Anna Sandoval's resignation announcement on Tuesday. Serving as a public servant has always been a passion of mine uh, with a recent announcement that this is an open seat. You know, I had to activate quickly. And obviously with recent developments, the timing was kind of right to throw my hat in and pursue that. The city clerk's office held a filing day for the first time, setting up to handle the initial rush. But this is far from the end of what we're going to see. The filing period lasts through February 17th and with 11 races, there are likely going to be a lot of names on that ballot. My staff told me that in the past we can have up to maybe 100 people in total. Those who have signed up are ready to campaign. You know, up until this point, it's all talk. Uh, putting pen to paper, it's now time to get to work. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Four schools might be closing their doors for good is South San ISD. A discussion and vote on that topic will be happening tonight during the district school board meeting and the closing of campuses Nothing new to parents and students in that area. Our John Paul Barajas is there as the meeting is getting ready to start. It should have started about six minutes ago. John Paul. The meeting is just getting kicked off right now, and you mentioned it. This is nothing new to parents and students of the district who saw three of the four schools in question today close in 2017 due to low enrollment and then reopened back in 2019. Parents we spoke to say tonight's vote is concerning. So it's something scary and want to be sure that we know more about it because I would I hope that wouldn't happen because it's so close and convenient to where we're at. And is school going to close? Is the school going to close? That's what a lot of people want to know. The four schools in question are Athens Elementary, Kindred Elementary, Kazan Middle School, and West Campus High School. Athens, Kazan, and West Campuses are the ones who were previously closed, then reopened. Tonight's meeting agenda did not say if enrollment numbers were the reason for the closer consideration this go around. As for where students will go if schools are shut down, all the agenda said is neighboring campuses. But again, that's if board members vote to close doors. Another thing to note is that TEA has an official here that will be monitoring tonight's decision. Coming up tonight at 10, we'll bring you what the board decides and what led up to this decision. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look here at a big traffic tie up. This is the Trans Guide camera I-35 at I-37. You can see we've got two big tow trucks there. It looked like as far as we could tell, some heavy machinery, some big equipment was being hauled by some 18 wheelers. This is being reported as a stalled vehicle. So perhaps one of those larger trucks with that heavy equipment had some issues there. That's what those flashing lights, those first responders are trying to get moving to get traffic moving here, but not a wreck reported, just a stalled vehicle at I-35 and I-37, certainly slowing things down really in both directions. New at six, a tiny bird is at the center of a growing battle over development in far north Bear County. The land north of 1604 is home to the endangered golden cheeked warbler, a bird native to our area. Jonathan Cotto explains how a proposed land swap is raising questions for some neighbors. Off of Resort Parkway near the JW Marriott Hotel, there's a clear distinction where nature ends and development starts. When they built and developed Cibolo Canyons, they uh, came up with an agreement to create a conservation easement to protect 700 and plus, well, maybe 740, 760 acres behind the development in perpetuity. Doris Brown and other neighbors are fighting to protect the endangered golden-cheeked warbler's habitat. 
The land has changed ownership since that first agreement. Now the current owners want to do a land swap. So on the face of it, it looks great. We're gonna, we're gonna just take this little bitty 63 and we're gonna give you guys 144 that we were gonna develop. It sounds great. Bird experts say that the warbler needs at a minimum 60 acres of connected continuous land for the bird to forage, to breed, and essentially thrive. Every golden cheek warbler that's ever been born was born right here in the state of Texas in the central uh, Texas area. Resident of the Bear Audubon Society, Britt Coleman, says the warbler requires 70% canopy coverage to survive. And that land swap doesn't provide that. We contacted Starward Land Advisors, LLC. The developer told us in his statement in part that they believe our plan is in the best interest of the long-term viability and sustainability of the Habitat Conservation Plan for Cibolo Canyons and the golden-cheeked warbler. The conservation easement that was Neighbors like Brown disagree, and they have until tomorrow to share concerns with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The problem with habitat destruction is compounded by the problem with habitat fragmentation, meaning that we are taking this habitat and we're carving it up into smaller and smaller and smaller units. Jonathan Cotto, KSET 12 News. Take a live look outside right now. 73 degrees out there. You know what? Hmm. Another beautiful day. It really was. I stepped out this afternoon. It was nice to see so much sunshine, even though a little warm for this time of year. Yeah, sunshine and cedar. <laughs> sunshine and cedar. And cedar was higher today than yesterday with a count of over a thousand. So we're feeling that and it's likely to stay elevated tomorrow. Now, despite the passage of a cold front this morning, we still made it to 79 for the high temperature. The average this time of year is 63 and we'll get down close to that in the days ahead. So not quite as warm the rest of this week. 73 right now, dew point of 31, still dry air in place behind that cold front. A wind though, northwest at eight, that's the key. It's not nearly as gusty as it was earlier today when it was up to 30 miles per hour at times. So the wind already pumping the brakes. By 10 o'clock, 55. By midnight, we're right at 50 degrees. And tomorrow morning, we're going to start the day near 40, have the jacket ready to go. Seguin 41, 39 Rio Medina, even 36 in Kerrville. Canyon Lake about 38, around San Antonio 40 degrees. We'll talk about the temperature trend because we do have two more cold fronts with some rain chances. Talk more about that in a bit. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. Thousands of dollars worth of merchandise stolen in just a matter of minutes. And video shows the moment that someone broke into a small business, why the owner here believes that this is part of a bigger pattern. Plus, dogs left for days inside of an apartment, and now that case is going to court, the decision that's being made about their future. We'll see you for these stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above the Alamo, one of the most beautiful spots in town on yet another beautiful day. Almost feels like spring out there, Adam. Yeah, it really does actually, you know, minus the humidity that we often get in the spring. We had the very dry air that moved in behind the cold front today. Wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour, but the wind has subsided, so that's nothing to worry about for the rest of the night or even into tomorrow either. Not as warm the rest of the week. You're going to be noticing that. You will want a jacket ready to go at the bus stop in the morning tomorrow. And a few rain chances are on the way. A few more opportunities for some rain, but don't get too excited about uh, what's on tap in terms of those rain chances. So let's get right to it, taking a look and get you ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we're right around 40 degrees, 41 downtown, 41 Von Army. You get to Bernie, Timberwood Park about 39. Then by the afternoon, we make it back above 70 degrees. 72 downtown San Antonio, Castroville Hondo 73. Meanwhile, upper 60s Bernie and Timberwood Park. Good amount of sunshine tomorrow. Very sunny day, crisp baby blue sky, north northwesterly wind at five to 10 miles per hour. So nothing like the wind that we saw today. And you look at our afternoon temperature trend and after tomorrow, we're back down into the 60s, mid 60s for Friday and Saturday. And then we even get down to near 60 for a high, potentially even upper 50s by Tuesday of next week. So not as warm as the past couple of days when we had some readings in the 80s parts of the case at 12 viewing area. Now right, let's take a look at the big picture. 
We had just a few light showers close to town, especially in Gonzales County earlier today. This is the big wound up low pressure system. Classic system, cold snow on the north side of it and then severe thunderstorms along the cold front here that's stretching into parts of the southeastern US. And overall, this is part of a broad upper level system. As usual, there's the upper level low just behind or the negative tilt as we call it just behind the surface low. So this system's still cranking. It's going to spread the snow northward and the rain and heavy moisture eastward. We're not going to tap into any of that. We do have this little dip in the upper level flow that's moving into the Pacific Northwest. Not a strong system, but it will strengthen a little bit as it continues its trek eastward. This is our next little opportunity for rain. Again, not much of a system, but it is bringing some moisture to parts of the west. This is going to drop southward, uh, bring some higher elevation snow, Utah, parts of Nevada even, and throughout the Rockies. But around here, we're going to miss out on most of the energy from this. It does give us an opportunity for a few showers, but nothing too significant. Take a look at our future cast 5 a.m. on Saturday. Saturday, that's that next chance. A few hit or miss light showers anticipated. If we're lucky, we could have one moderate shower here or there, especially east of San Antonio, but overall not adding up to much and unfortunately nothing to get excited about. We're giving it a 30% chance. That's it on Saturday. So no opportunity for rain Thursday and Friday. Then by Saturday, we're at 30% Monday into Tuesday. That's another opportunity, but right now that's overnight. Monday night into early Tuesday, and that still is just a 30% chance. So dry tomorrow, a lot of sunshine, 40 in the morning, 65 at noon, high 71 degrees. We talked about those high temperatures dropping off back into the 60s and notice those morning temperatures for the most part in the 40s, even down to 42 Sunday morning, but then 37 on Monday morning. That's going to be one of our low points in terms of temperatures. Notice those two cold fronts, one late Saturday and then again late Monday. It's no coincidence. We have a slight chance of a few showers around those fronts, but right now, unfortunately, just at 30%. There is some hope for raising those rain chances for Monday night. So we'll keep you updated. All right, and some cooler air on the way. Thanks, Adam. All right, he is, in my opinion, the on-court leader of the San Antonio Spurs, <laughs> and boy, did he have a great game last night. Larry. He did, yeah. Keldon Johnson set a career high in scoring. Now, he wasn't hot from beyond the three-point arc, but he made a big one at the end of the game to help the Spurs beat the Nets. And then he broke out a brand-new celebration, which he will explain <laughs> coming up. And the Dallas Cowboys, they are craving a Super Bowl after the break. I mean, it felt great. I mean, I, I can't lie. They called time out right after. I was hyped. Um, but, you know, like I continue to say, my coaches and, and teammates put the ball in my hand, and, you know, I just made something happen. Kelvin Johnson made a key three-pointer with less than a minute to go in the fourth quarter to help the Spurs beat the Nets in big board sports. Led by Kelvin Johnson and his career-high 36 points, the Spurs beat the Nets 106-98 last night to end their five-game losing streak. The Spurs outscored the Nets in the first quarter 27-15. It's the fewest points scored by a Spurs opponent in the first quarter of this season. Johnson made just three of his 11 three-point attempts, sinking his final one with 57 seconds left to give the Spurs an eight-point lead. During his celebration, he broke out a new one, casting a fishing rod, which he happily explained after the game. <laughs> It's crazy. Me, 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 and one of my good friends, uh, he go bass, bass fishing a lot. So we always talking about throwing it out there. We smacking him in the water. And I told, I told him if I, if I hit the three, I'm gonna throw the line out there. See, test it out there. So I had to do it. You know what I mean? But um, you know, it's just having fun with it. Honestly, just coming up with something different. He threw the line out there. The Spurs will host the Clippers Friday night at 7 at the AT&T Center. Speaking of the Clippers, they were hosting the Sixers last night, and Kawhi Leonard steals the ball and races back for a slam dunk. The claw led LAC with 27 points. Now back at the other end, James Harden will feed Joel Embiid. He fakes a three, then shoots a three, and nails it to beat the first half buzzer. He scored 26 in the first half in a game-high 41 to help the Sixers take it 120-110. to The Clippers are now 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games. 
The last night in boys high school basketball, John Paul II opened their brand new gym with a long awaited home win, beating Corpus Christi and Carnivore 76 to 30. That marked the Guardians first home game since the school opened in 2009. So they're used to traveling to every contest, but now they have a brand new gym that they can call home. The Guardians used to practice on campus in a 70 foot gym on an old elementary tile floor with a low ceiling, but now they can scrimmage and host games on a court that's 94 feet. Plus, they have a true home court advantage they've never had and the Guardians are loving it. You, you saw y'all saw it today. Crowd crazy. One three. Boom. Crazy. Crazy. Just being able to scrimmage, having a live scrimmage that's 94 feet, being able to get into our transition and actually do it on 94 feet is is huge for us. Uh, so you know I don't know if it's gonna be a disadvantage for other teams, but I know it gives us the advantage we need to be able to compete against the type of teams we need to beat and have beaten uh, despite it. Coach also said it's been a journey getting to this point and that it's a dream come true to play in that building and represent that community. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. After taking care of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in round one of the playoffs, 31-14, the Dallas Cowboys are now focused on the San Francisco 49ers in the division around Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Last season, the Niners won at Dallas 23-17 on Wild Card Weekend. Some feel that's all the motivation the boys need to win this one, but J. Ron Kerr says it goes beyond that. We want to win it all. The guys around here, we, you know, we... We, 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 we're craving the Super Bowl, so, uh, you know, they're in the way of that, and, you know, that's enough motivation for us. Craving a Super Bowl, and Curse also said today that his left knee is fine and he will play in this game. You know, I think you should try the casting thing that Keldon Johnson <laughs> did. Like, at the end of the cast, just like, I kind of like that. I like the sound yeah. effect, too. you got to have that. Our local fisherman, Adam Kasky, liked it. He did. He I did. heard him. Yeah, 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 I like that. I think it got a Kasky approval. Maybe Keldon can join his fishing team. <laughs> Ice fishing? With the costumes. Oh. I don't think Keldon's going to go ice fishing with him, <laughs> but maybe just fishing. Thanks, Larry. All right, coming up next, we're going to do some myth busting when it comes to COVID-19 and talk about a development of a new kind of vaccine. Stay with us. We actually started this segment, KSAT Q&A, to sort of separate the fact from the fiction when it comes to COVID-19. That was some two years ago when we started this segment. We're going to get back to our roots right now and talk about some of the fact and the fiction when it comes to current COVID-19 variants that are out there and the vaccine. Dr. Larry Schlesinger joins us. He is the president and CEO of Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Doctor, it's always a pleasure to have you on. I, I want to talk about a Johns Hopkins report that was released yesterday that COVID is still the third leading cause of death in the United States. More than a million people have died from COVID since it hit the country. Are we being too nonchalant when it comes to this and some of the variants that we're seeing? Should we mask up? What are some of the steps we should be taking when it comes to COVID? Well, it's a great question. Great to be with you. Absolutely, COVID-19 continues to be a very serious infection. We constantly talk about in and out of a pandemic or a triple pandemic. The truth is we have a serious respiratory viral infection traveling the country still. It's estimated there are about four or 500 deaths due to COVID-19 due to COVID-19 uh, each day. If you annualize that, uh, that's actually a rate of death uh, higher than even a serious flu uh, epidemic. So we still have a serious problem related to COVID-19. And I think we need to be careful. We need to use our judgment. And uh, if we're in a high congregate setting with a high likelihood of exposure, we better be careful, particularly if we're, our immune systems are not normal. So um, I, I think it's something we need to take care of. And one of the uh, aspects of this is the newest uh, vaccine, the bivalent vaccine, which is the one that has been found to be the best protection against some of these new variants. And the uptake of that vaccine is only about 15 or 20 percent. Mm. So we are not doing a good job of vaccinating up. And these vaccines have been incredibly important in our fight against COVID-19. I could talk more about that. 
Let's talk about some of the myths, the misconceptions that currently exist. We're nearly three years into living with COVID-19 and a recent survey that from Rasmussen reports said that nearly half of Americans believe that COVID vaccines have probably caused a significant number of unexplained deaths. Is there any evidence to back that up? There is no evidence to back that up. And I have to say, we continue to have misinformation regarding this vaccine, inclu including some recent deaths that have occurred, our football player story. Uh, there is no evidence that this was caused by COVID-19. Look, here are the facts. The data are out now. 1.1 uh, oh, million people in the United States have died from COVID. The vaccine is estimated to have prevented over 3 million deaths due to COVID-19. The vaccines prevented nearly 20 million hospitalizations and over a trillion dollars of cost to the U.S. economy. Worldwide, the estimates are about, the vaccines have protected about 20 million people. And guess what? That's what vaccines do. Historically, vaccines against a number of infections has saved hundreds of millions of lives. So these vaccines work. They don't uh, completely prevent infection. We know that already, but we're talking about serious life-threatening infection, particularly in vulnerable people. Uh, the vaccines are performing well, but we must uh, increase that bivalent vaccine. I, I know Texas Biomed played a, a key role in the Pfizer vaccine, a, and you're working on something now called, and I want to make sure I get this right, a live attenuated approach to vaccine. Right. What does that mean? Right, so um, uh, right now we have the mRNA vaccines and they're very powerful, but there's still some question about their so-called durability. They seem to last only a period of perhaps four at most six months. And so everyone's asking the question, what does this mean, Dr. Schlesinger? Do you need to take, a, do we need to take vaccines four times a year? So going forward, we need more durable vaccines that perhaps last a year, just like the influenza vaccine. And we need vaccines that stimulate our immune system to protect it against more of these variants. So broader protection. One of the time-honored approaches for achieving durability and broad protection are so-called live attenuate vaccines. The smallpox vaccine, chickenpox, yellow fever, these are established vaccine strategies. And at Texas Biomed, scientists are producing, using new technology, a form of live attenuated vaccine that's performing very well in the so-called preclinical arena. We're excited about this technology. It's one of a few that are out there now in terms of increasing that duration and that protection. So what we need now is to continue to fuel the research engine going forward so that we can bring these newer technologies that will be more powerful and protect humans. And I'm afraid we're at the beginning of this fatigue where it's people are talking about it less and guess what? The money starts getting tighter and we can't move these new technologies forward. I think that's our challenge going forward, but I'm excited about this new technology and there's new therapies also in the pipeline that Texas Biomed is working on. We talked a lot, a lot about a live attenuated vaccine right here on Monday in a case that explains with the help of some of your, your researchers. So that was that was really helpful to distinguish the differences. Before we let you go, I, I want to ask about the variants that we see that they keep on coming when it comes to COVID-19. There's been another misconception that more boosters mean more variants. Explain why we continue to see different variations of this virus. Yeah, does one cause another? Right, so um, look, uh, vaccines and therapies can put some pressure on the virus uh, that uh, can ultimately help evolve the virus. However, m the vast majority of these variants are being caused by the fact that the virus is circulating, whether you're vaccinated or not enough, and this virus will continue to mutate. So to answer your question, it is not the vaccine that caused the new strain, for example, the XBB 1.5, which is um, really the predominant uh, variant now in the Northeast and about 20, 15 to 20% of cases in Texas due to this variant is not caused by the vaccine. Uh, this vac these variants are because the virus continues to circulate in the population. And what do viruses do? They evolve in you and me. 
The truth of the matter is the safety profile of the vaccine. Yes, it's not 100% no vaccine is, but when you look at these so-called side effects that are being looked to looked into by the uh, um, uh, FDA and others, they're pale in comparison to all the side effects of having a true COVID-19 infection. 10 to 20% of people with COVID have this long COVID where now over 200 symptoms have been described, uh, other forms of inflammation. So there's much worse outcome due to the virus than there is to the vaccine. Dr. Larry Schlesinger, yeah, I, I agree that we need to keep talking about the seriousness of COVID. We also need to keep talking about the fact that we need new technology and new viruses to fight not only COVID, but what may el what else may be coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. And I really believe Texas Biomed is going to be part of the solution going forward. We have new partnerships with industry and government that we'll tell you about over time. But I believe we really have that unique enterprise that can really help solve the problem of more protection against these increasing infectious threats. Dr. Schlesinger, President and CEO of Texas Biomedical Research Institute, thanks for sharing some time with us. My pleasure. Good to see you both. Have a great night. We'll be right back.